Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the bi-weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Culinary School Stories podcast, a proud member of the Food Media Network. So now, let's meet today's guest, who at the young age of 30 wanted an early midlife career change, so she sold her New York City condo, packed up, and moved to Scottsdale, Arizona, and enrolled in La Cordon Bleu Culinary School. And she has never looked back. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to welcome Chef Stephanie Heller to the show. Stephanie, thanks for being here with us today and sharing your culinary school story. Thank you, Colin. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) Great. So as mentioned in the opening, you packed up and moved to Scottsdale and went to school at Le Cordon Bleu. So tell us why Scottsdale, why the Cordon Bleu? Yeah, so I grew up in New York my whole life. You'll hear it in my accent as we go on. And it was just the the hustle and bustle of the city was just eating me alive at that time. And I was like, I need something new. And my family had been vacationing in Scottsdale for about 10 years. So I knew the place well. It was good weather, easy to live. And by 29, 30, I was like, got to (laughs) go. So I came out here and my mom moved at the same time and then my grandma moved. So I had a couple of people I knew. Wow. So a lot warmer too, I imagined uh, as well. Yeah. Now, why did you pick Cordon Bleu? Just because it was in that area or you had already done some research on it? Yeah, I actually toured only two schools. I toured Le Cordon, Le Cordon Bleu and then Arizona Culinary Institute, which is also in Scottsdale. And... I liked the the Cordon Bleu name. The guy showed me the diploma that I would get. And I'm like, I want one of those. (laughs) I knew it would look good on my resume. I knew it would stand out. And it was a great program. So tell us about it. It was a two-year, I guess, associate's degree, because I think they have certificates and maybe bachelor's and things. So what was the program, what it was, and what part of it you studied? It was culinary arts, not baking pastry or management. Exactly. I actually had a bachelor's from Boston University. So I did the certificate culinary program, which was eight months. And like you said, we did basic cooking, meat fabrication, um, soups, and international. And then we did a front of the house and the externship and then pastry. So a little bit of everything. (laughs) And uh, now, how was it? Because you were... 30, 29. I'm yeah. sure you were in there with 18 year old high school students, just graduates. How, right. how was that? How did you, how did you make that work? How did you adapt? Yeah, it was hard. It brought me back to being in college a lot. And it was a lot of, you know, 80% guys and their main goal was to go drinking after and, <laughs> you know, the whole like way culinary school could be. But I was like, already 30. And I was like, how, how can I get caught in this again? And, and I actually did for a little while, like, you know, stayed out late, partied. And then I got to the part where I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I got serious, but, um, it was kind of like going back in time a little bit. Yeah. I imagine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now did out of those classes, did you have a favorite? What was the best one? Was it, what was your, what was your first one? I mean, was that that yeah. set the tone or did it make you question it? Tell us about going through the program. I actually loved the first class, which was basics and the teacher happened to be from Brooklyn. So he was also a transplant to Scottsdale and I just felt like his accent and at home with him, but he was really tough. And, um, it was a lot like basic training. It felt very military, like, you know, lining up outside, checking your uniform, setting up your station a certain way and a fraternity where you're, you know, being friends with these people and you're hanging out with them after. But, um, his class was really strict, but I didn't come from a cooking family. So I needed to learn all of those things like 
I didn't know how to fabricate a chicken. I didn't know how to make a base for a sauce. A lot of people knew how to do those things and I didn't. So I liked that class a lot. And um, our school had a restaurant. So our last um, section was working in that restaurant of the school. And that I loved because you got a different station every time and you got a different menu every night. So that was cool. Oh, great. Now, were you treated any different because you were older? Did they look up to you? Did they expect you to be their, their mother or to lead them along? Yeah. Or they, are they looking down on you like you don't have any experience? What are you doing here? Yeah, I don't know. I bet it was a mix. There was, like I said, 80% of the guys were 18 to 20 years old. There was one older gentleman. He was like, 60 and then there was maybe two two women my age like late 20s early 30s and I think when we got paired into groups the guys were excited when they got one of us because they were like oh they'll take control and they'll clean it up and they'll do it right and we could kind of mess around um but again I wouldn't want to lift really heavy stuff like they would or you know do the disgusting things so It was a good match. I don't know. (laughs) Good balance, right? Yeah. (laughs) Now, tell me about the chefs there. You said you had this uh, connection with this, the one chef because of his accent and where he was from. Did you connect with others? Was there others that turned you off? I mean, I know mentors, mentees, that happens sometimes. So maybe you could speak to that a little. Totally. I would either, like you said, you connect with somebody or you kind of don't, but you still want to show up to the class and pay attention and be there. But um, I remember pastry being really hard for me because it was the first time you have to weigh and measure and be very precise. And it will totally screw up if, you know, you're off on one thing or you miss one thing. And um, he was very strict as well. So we would have to redo everything and throw it out and just crazy stuff. Um who else? Our international teacher was from the Philippines. So he was hard to understand, but he was the best teacher because he had like total experience traveling around the world and anything he gave to us, he knew what it would taste like, what it would look like, what was wrong with it just by looking at it. So that was great. Yeah. I can imagine if they have that, bring that real world life experience to it, you know, that it comes across in, not only in the production, but in their stories and their lectures and how they, they produce the material and tell you about it. Let's mm-hmm. talk about uh, BU, Boston University, what you studied there and how did it compare class, workload, rigor to culinary school? Right. That's interesting. So I studied psychology I have a BA in psychology as well. And I, I call college going for the experience, not for what you're learning. Because then I was young. I was 18. I was 20 years old. And I, you know, you want to go out and meet people. But um, psychology was extremely easy for me. And that's why I chose it. Not because, like, I wanted to be a psychologist. It was just something I got quickly. So I was like, I'm going to choose this. We did have a quite a bit of work. It is a, a, you know, a very big, well-known school. You don't just get to sit there and hang out. But um, that was for the real experience of it. I would consider culinary school to learn the craft, to have a business. That's why I went. So the first one, Boston University, was more, you're going to college, now you got to pick a degree because you need to do something while you're there. And you just pick something that kind of maybe interests. But culinary was different. This is serious money career, time, you and older, you were ready. Right. And I was like, if I'm going to go back to school and put, you know, another, it was quite expensive. It was like another $20,000 just for the certificate. Um, and I had already spent four years out of university. Like I better make good on this. That's, that's yeah. what I was telling myself. That's one of the cons that you hear a lot about culinary school is the price. And it's because the classes are small Mm -hmm. and there's so much product they have to buy. It's not just a textbook in theory. It's like you're, everyone gets a chicken or a fish and you're fabricating and it costs money. Totally. Uh, So they gave you, I'm assuming, knife kit, uniforms, Mm -hmm. all that stuff. That's usually the fun part, right? It's like the birthday or the holiday Christmas time. Hey, I'm getting gifts. This is wonderful. (laughs) Exactly. I was like, I never had so many high quality tools in my apartment or even, you know, growing up, we would just, you know, have whatever. 
but to have like a whole knife set. I didn't even know what a Santuku knife was <laughs> or the shape. Um, I didn't know like the names of the knives and the sizes and the weights of it. So it was cool to get all that stuff. And coming from home cook type of thing, it's a big difference because you might pick up knives at, I don't know, Target or someplace like that, and they're cheap and you get a whole set for $30. Right. Here, one chef knife is a couple hundred mm -hmm. and, you know, they last a whole lifetime. So they're made for that professional. Totally. Did anyone cut themselves? That usually happens because oh, they're yeah. so sharp and they want to run their finger down. Of course. Stuff. <laughs> Especially, I mean, when I started working at a restaurant, and the knife sharpener would come, he would come like once every 10 days and whoever wanted their knives sharpened, he would do it professionally for you in the back. And the second you got your knife back, she would cut you. Like no matter how I touched it, what I was cutting, if I'd done it a thousand times before, it would be like blood everywhere. So, <laughs> yeah, for that. <laughs> it does happen a lot. So tell me about the the courses at culinary school that set you up for business? I mean, I mean, did they have cost control, menu planning, business, academic type classes that help set up besides just the, you know, the, the practical part? They did not in the certificate part that I did. That was totally hands-on practical cooking. Um, in the bachelor's, they did. So people would be mixed into my class at the end who were still finishing off their bachelor's and they would be in costing and how to pur purchase things, stuff like that. And I would look at what they're doing and I'm like, this is so confusing. What are you doing? And they were like, I'm not good at math. I don't know what to do. Um, and I think a lot of people were lost. So I didn't have that training there. That was just cooking and learning how to be in a kitchen and learning how to show up and perform. So that certificate was more like the first step and then you'd go on and then you'd get some of this other, you know, business part. I did. I actually, because I knew I wanted to be a personal chef and I know we're going to talk about this. I took a course from a personal chef educator program to start your business. Okay. They did not teach you how to cook. They didn't teach you how to do any of that. They only taught you how to set up your business. So that was a good match then because you had the mm -hmm. culinary practical in this. So let, let's go there. What did you do after school? Did you go right into personal chef? Did you go into restaurants? Tell us, you know, how that kind of path took and if it, what part excited you, turned you off. Tell us about the first step into the industry. Right. So at the end of school, we had to do our externship and I had already worked in maybe one or two places. But I started at Bourbon Steak, which is the Michael Mina restaurant. And we opened, I was the opening crew. And it was such hard work, as you know, opening a location from a corporate entity. You know, there's every single thing has to be done a certain way. And it was at a fancy hotel here, the Princess. So I was like, this is going to be a great experience. I'll have it on my resume. And I thought I could be there for a year. And after my externship, which was maybe three or four months, I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> I cannot do this. <laughs> Again, people, the, everyone was a guy. Everyone was half my age. And I'm like, I have to do something else. And I always knew I wanted to be a personal chef for three main reasons. The first was I wanted to impact people directly and see their reaction and be able to be in their lives. I wanted to make my own schedule and I wanted to not have an income ceiling. Whereas waiting for somebody to hand you a paycheck or just saying, this is your pay grade right now. I wanted to make whatever I wanted. So that's when I quit at the restaurant and I took this course, I invested more money and I was like, I'm just, I'm going to start my business and that's it. Now, did you be a personal chef first, a private chef, like, you know, and kind of test the waters a little bit? Or did you say, no, after this course, I'm all in and you just opened up your business? I am like a burn all bridges girl. I was like, <laughs> I contacted one or two sh personal chefs and I was like, let me shadow you. I can work for you for free. And people were very close minded. They did not want to let you in on their secrets and their clients. And it was a very closed industry at that time. And I'll, I could talk about that more later, but um, 
it was kind of like a no over and over. And I was like, who cares? I'm going to go to, I'll just learn how to do it. And I, I live in an area where it is perfect for it. Like I had no question of area. Like Scottsdale has a ton of resorts, a ton of high end uh, people that live here and move here with second and third homes. So I knew it was a good area. Why do you think those personal chefs were like that? Is it competition? They saw you as a threat? I wasn't even a good, a good cook or anything at that point. But even as I got bigger in my business, people were very closed off to, I don't want to work together. I don't want to show you how I do this. I don't want you to look at my menus. You can't know my pricing. And that's one of the reasons why I started coaching other chefs because they kept getting the door slammed in their face. And I was like, what's the secret? Just you helping somebody else is not taking a client away from you. It's only building your like repertoire. I don't know. It made no sense to me. Well, that's kind of the way old chefs were. You know, they would have their recipes hidden and nobody could right. see them. And they were the only one that made that particular sauce or dish. And, you know, it was almost like in their mind, some kind of job security, but it really didn't make sense because pass it on. You learned it from somebody, pass it on to somebody else. And it's good for business because what happens if you're ill one day or you quit or right. something happens? I mean, you need to have those standardized recipes that everybody can make, but... Totally. I guess it's just, you know, that was the, the, the time and it, hopefully it's, it's changing more. Yeah. So before we talk about your business and, and where you're going, can you just give a little bit of right off the bat advice? If somebody wanted, that's listening, and I'm sure there is, that wants to be a private chef or a personal chef, and maybe you could talk about that. Is there a difference? And then yeah. how, what would you tell them is the best way? What was the best approach, the most efficient approach for them to do that? Would it be your route or is there some other possibility? Yeah, there's, I'll tell you the difference first. So what I consider a personal chef works for many different families or individuals. They usually have a service that they offer. And like I said, we'll work for anywhere from three to 10 clients at a time. A private chef usually works for one family or business at a time. They could be under contract. They could be on payroll um, or hourly but usually you're committed for a certain amount of time to that one family. Okay. Makes sense. Yep. If people want to get into it, there's a lot of ways. Like you said, I, you could approach people doing it now and saying, Hey, can I come work for you? Or are you hiring? You could take a course and learn how to set it up yourself. You could put feelers out in your community and kind of do it as a hobby first. Like, People used to post on Craigslist or Nextdoor, you know, mm -hmm. like those platforms and say, I'm doing meals for the week. Who wants it for a low price? And then just get experience. Um, I am big on just doing it right the first time and just learn how to set up the business. And then you will get clients and get it going. Whereas if you don't, you're kind of always working backwards. Like... Chefs will come to me now and be like, I have 10 clients, but I don't know how to charge people. I have no money in my account. And, you know, it's all backwards. Like you should learn. I think you should learn that first. Sure. It's a business. Yeah. Now, do you, do you think culinary school is needed or is it just a bonus or is it just a good to have for a personal or private chef? I think it's needed. I wanted it because I knew it would make me stand out because anyone could go and say they're a personal chef. But when you have spent time in a, in a program or a university learning that, it is very different than the people who don't. I just think it adds more structure. It shows that you're dedicated. Um, when I began hiring chefs to work for me, I, I of course, I hired people that didn't go to culinary school because they were excellent. But it's definitely something I looked for as an employer also. And is it help with networking at all? Knowing people it, go into culinary school, maybe past instructors or people that you went to school with, does that help in that part of it as well? Definitely. I would always contact culinary schools first to try to hire people. And where I was an alum, and actually in three different schools, I was allowed to present as a personal chef and teach them that that's an option. So I went back to my school and then two other schools and I was like, who wants a job and who's interested in this? And we got definitely. So that helped for sure. Good. So if you're in culinary school and this is an avenue you don't want to pursue, 
you know, maybe someone would come in and speak about it. But if if they're not, what um, what can they do for a living? I mean, what what are the benefits? What are the pros if they were instead of going the traditional route into a restaurant? Tell us some of the positives or negatives as well that they would have as a personal or private chef. The biggest positive when people reach out to me is they're sick of having a 10 or 12 hour day where they never get to decide their schedule or see their family or they have young kids. They can't date. And that was also with me too. So deciding your own schedule and like designing your life, I know that's a fancy word, but um, is so important to so many people. And that's the first thing that people love about this. The second is you get to create your own food and what you're good at and then match it to the client. Um, Also, not putting your food through a window or to an expediter is very different than going around to the client's table and setting it down and seeing their face or having their kids come home after school and you're waiting there and they're the happiest (laughs) to see you. (laughs) Like that is cool. Um, I like the income possibilities are much, much higher than a traditional restaurant. If you, what I, what I call do it right, you know, set it up right. Um, What else? The downside is in the beginning, there's a lot of ups and downs. Like one week you could have zero clients. The next week you could have five. And the stability of learning how to market and set up a business so you don't have those ups and downs is is going to be your problem for the first one to three years. Most people will quit after the first year if they can't figure that out, which is why I always say get training first because cooking has nothing to do with running a business. You're doing two different things. And people think if they're a good cook that if this is going to work. And I'm like, no, you have to learn how to run a business and get in front of people. Um, people can't take the ups and downs. Health insurance 401k, that's something you have to figure out on your own. And people are scared of that. So people with families don't want to take the risk. Um, I started when I was single. So I just would buy health insurance because you could. And it worked out fine. What else? I love it because you could take your skill with you and travel somewhere else. Like I lived in Israel for a while and cooked there. And even though they didn't know, they weren't so obsessed with what a personal chef was. They didn't really understand it. It was still valuable and I could still make money wherever I was. So I like that. So it's more custom and it gave you that work-life balance and you got to customize your own food. You get to be more creative. Right. But at the same time, you don't have that steady income. You're not an employee to say of, of some company. So you have to be in it for the long haul and expect those kind of ups and downs, at least at the beginning, like any business. Yes. But most people don't get that. They're like, your risk tolerance is very, very small. And you think like, I made no money in two weeks and I can't do this anymore. But you could not make money for a whole month. And then you could make, you know, $5,000 in a month. So you have to learn also how to budget and balance. Um, it's, It's definitely a skill to learn. And I've talked to people before that are in this kind of segment of the industry, and they say that culinary school background is so valuable because it, worst case, when they do have those valleys, if they're really long, they can go and use that skill to do something else. Yes. Maybe go back in and work part-time or help out a caterer or do something along those lines to bring in some revenue. Definitely. So tell us then, let's jump ahead now. Where are you now? You went from being a private chef, now you're, you're running like an agency. Is that something? You have chefs that work for you? Do they contract through you? Are they employees? Tell us how that is working. Oh, let's go back a second. I started my business and then in year two, I would, the phone would ring more than I could work. So I wanted to work five or six days a week. Sometimes I worked seven, but the phone kept ringing. And then I said, I'm going to hire somebody who worked for me. And I chose a girl. She already knew how to cook. She was an excellent cook. And I just taught her what we do in the client's homes and she would do it. And I would pay her an hourly rate and then I would charge the client like I managed it. So she was like an apprentice. She was kind of learning that industry part of it at the same time while she was getting paid. Yeah, exactly. But so they were subcontractors and she could still have her own jobs, 
on her own clients. She could work somewhere else. But when I had a job or she was booked, she would come work for me. And she wound up working at least five days a week. So she was almost full time. And that kind of just took off from there. So by year three and four, I had four people that worked for me. And I was still working in clients' homes. And then I would say by year seven, I said, I can't keep growing it if I'm going to keep cooking in people's homes every day. So I started taking less and less jobs, which was very hard because I was still answering the phone. So I heard the people calling like this NFL player would call and want service. And I'm like, oh, I should do that one. And like, (laughs) you know, you, you, cause you think you're so important, but I was not so important or the best cook at all. So you would have to see these amazing jobs come in and let them go to your people. So that's what I did. And then by years eight and nine, I hired a culinary manager who would answer the phone and she would book the jobs, collect the payment, schedule the chef, make the menu, everything. So I became like the true owner, owner, like separate. And then I would work on marketing, partnerships, stuff like that. And then just last year was the 11th year and I wanted to do business coaching full time. I had been doing it for a few years in there and um, was in a certification to be a life coach as well. So I struck a deal with somebody who worked for me to buy part of the company and he got certain things, you know, the client list training, like a bunch of stuff. And then I got to keep the name, the online reviews, other things in case I wanted to reopen it. So it's a technically a closed business now. And I do business coaching and life coaching full time. Interesting. Who's the, who's the customer? Is that a chef? Chef could come to you and, and get the coaching or who, who does the coach gets the coaching? So I have a lot of chefs that come to me who want to learn how to start their business. And I would say 40% of my clients are in that industry. And some of them want to do something different with their culinary background. They want to do a membership site for recipes and learning how to cook. Someone is doing um, biscuits and dressing and crab cakes. And then another one has a staffing agency for chefs to place them in restaurants. So people are coming to me for all sorts of things, which I love. And then 60% or the other half is business owners that want help growing their business outside of culinary. It could be any business. Yeah. But usually they work with their hands. So it could be a jewelry designer, a handyman, an artist, somebody who wants to be creative, but doesn't know how to run a business. Wow. So you've really taken it and grown and now you've expanded beyond (laughs) that moving to Scottsdale, right? (laughs) It's taken off from there. So if someone wanted to break into it and and just couldn't start their business yet, um, how about agencies? I know a lot of personal private chefs, they work with agencies, Miami, New York City, they get involved with them, they upload their resume, they find them positions or they place them almost like an executive search firm type thing. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit and see, is it good? Is it bad? Yeah, I think it's a great way to get experience and get into different homes because like you said, they have the jobs that can place you there. So you will get into homes and places that you would never have access to. And it's, that's a lot of fun. I know many of them in Scottsdale because they do, like you said, executive placement for chefs or cooks in private homes. And it's awesome because you get the job and you have that way in. But then again, the trade-off is your pay. So you're not going to have, you know, the, $7,500 $7,500 an hour, you're probably going to be paid around 30, 25, 40, something around there, but you still get into these homes. So, so it's a good way to break in and get a start and get a name right. for yourself and start, get some experience in there, though you're $40 an hour as opposed to $100 an hour. Yeah. Right? You're- and you could be hired full time by the families. Like if they, and then you go into, you know, employment with them, which could easily be seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year as their chef, and then you're not with the agency, but you've been placed. And I've heard from others before that, you know, they have a little bit of a 
I guess you would call it a, maybe an imposter syndrome when they first start. Like, I don't know if I what I'm really doing and I'm I'm a fake. Yeah. But once they get that first job or two, they start one, they build their confidence too. Now they say they're in, they're like in the club. Mm -hmm. Now they've got their name and then they tell friends and then other people are hiring them. Right. It kind of just blossoms from that. Is that true? Is that, have you found that? Totally. I mean, when you get like, we all, I always talk about this in my group. Like when you get your first athlete or your first um, movie star or somebody so big and you are in that person's home you're literally standing there like, how am I here? Like, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to do anything. And it's like, sometimes you freeze up <laughs> and you're messing stuff up. You've done a thousand times before, but you grow into it. And then it becomes like comfortable for you. And then even more of them hire you, which is what I found. If you are comfortable with yourself and you know you could do the job there in that you know 10 million dollar house which has things you've never seen in your life um they feel that and then they will tell their friends and it just goes from there because a lot of it is word of mouth right they have to have that trust and then they just share oh, i got a person for yeah. you at that point yeah and then people will come over like their teammates come over and they'll see your logo and be like oh do you can you come to my house or do you know anybody else so you being comfortable and even feeling an imposter syndrome, but feeling it and saying, who cares? I know I could cook. I'm supposed to be here. I earned this, you know, just be there. Now, when you get these clients, do they ever have the chef that they're hiring do a practice cook, uh, come in and do a trial mm -hmm. period, like cook me a meal? Is, is that part of the um, application or the job uh, employment requirement? It could be. When I was first starting out, that's how it was for me. So someone would contact me. It might be their current chef, their house manager, their assistant. And they would say, XYZ is looking for a new chef. Can you come in and do some trial cook days? And then one woman, I would cook side by side with her. Other times they would say, submit a menu and we'll approve it. And then we'll schedule your days. Then once I got hired, she would train me because he had very specific allergies and dietary things to continue playing in his 40s. Like he had a very specific strategy for everything. Um, but then when I really ran my business ripe and had eight chefs that work for me, athletes would call the business and say, this is what we want. Who do you have? And then we would schedule that. You kind of find a specific person, their skill level, what they're looking for on that particular exactly. diet. Exactly. Personality thing. also oh, okay. is really important. So how do you learn to cook in someone's home as opposed to a restaurant? Because restaurants are different. You're dealing with yeah. you know, big tickets coming in and a certain meal period. So there must be a different, <laughs> obviously, uh, kind of thought process that you would have to go through. Could you talk about that? Totally. Like... You set a restaurant, you you have your par list, you have to mise en place everything, you know, before your service starts. The ingredients are already ordered for you, everything's on site. So it's very different. Personal chef, you are usually taking a custom menu, going to a food store, buying what you need, going to the client's home, cooking it there. Usually we cook meals for the week, so package it, label it, put it in the fridge. And the chef has to learn how to do the portions for the service, the way that we sell it, because we're selling a weekly service. So we don't want to make so much where they don't call next week. And you don't want to make too little where they're calling you on Thursday and they're being like, I have no food left and I paid $350. So we teach them that. Um, being the person that people want in their home is one of the most important things because in the restaurant, you don't have to deal with that. You're working on a line with people you know usually. You're almost hidden from the public. Mm -hmm. And a lot of restaurant chefs have a hard time transitioning into the home because they're used to nobody watching. And, you know, so personality is really important. Um, working clean, obviously, you're on display usually. People are watching you. Um, not purchasing stuff you don't need, wasting the client's money or the business's money and being responsible for the products that you're putting out. So when you're on a line, I feel like 
not that your work could be hidden, but like if it comes back and it's no good and it's your station, like obviously you're going to redo it. But when you're in someone's home, you're responsible for the output. Like the client is looking to you for that and you have to rise up to that. Because yeah, in a restaurant, it's almost like a manufacturing process. You're back there, you're doing one part of maybe a dish. It's all coming together. Right. Your head down, nobody's watching. It's really right. industrial. Where here, you have to be, you know, like a food network. You know, you're there. Yeah. You got it's all about how you look, how you wear, what you're wearing, right. and and personality. I imagine you got to talk to these people. Mm -hmm. You can't be an introvert and quiet. So you got to, you know, you're their chef, right? Right. Exactly. Now talk about pay. How did you buy this stuff for them? Do you, do you charge the client? Do you have like their credit card and you buy the stuff or do you buy it and then you sell it back to them at a upsell or is it the same price? How, do, how does that work? Yeah. So the way that I had set up my business was they purchased the service. So let's say it's food for the week. They would get 16 meals or whatever their package was. And that would be $300. And then we would bill food separately. So we would keep a credit card on file and they would pay for the week of service. And then at the end of the week, they would be charged for that food that was theirs. And a lot of chefs do it differently. Some include food where they do a flat rate for everything. But we found that, especially because people want organic and specialty ingredients here, that I didn't want the service price to not come through like, if the food was, or like have to limit what they wanted. So we just always charge food separately. Usually it's not an issue at all. People are, are like, okay, they don't care. Because they could want, I don't know, steak and lobster oh. as opposed to yeah. pasta and all veg vegetarian yeah. or something. And so here I could see how having it separate would be good. But do you have to give them an itemize the, the, the receipt or is it just like there was $250 this week? That's it. I would say once the relationship gets going, they don't care. They don't even ask for it. Usually we take a picture and it's emailed to them with their menu from the following week. So you know, nobody cares once you have that trust. Sure. And they just want to make sure they're not getting ripped off right. and that someone's taking advantage. Yeah. So who's the most famous person you ever cooked for? I mean, you just talked about celebrities, talking about yeah. athletes. Or who, who, who have you heard people cooking for? I mean, I'm sure there's, you probably have good clients and bad clients. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you talk about how that relationship works and do you do you have a special list for the ones that you don't want to work with or you do want to work with or how does that all work? I will say everyone thinks that really, really wealthy people are going to be very demanding and hard to work with. And it is 95% not the case at all. They're just regular people who want regular food. Normally, they don't even want fancy things. Um, that said, depending on where they are on the spectrum and in their lives, they may be used to a certain level of service and can be disappointed very easily. So for example, a new player in the NBA who's first away from his family, he literally doesn't even buy food for himself. And then you will have somebody in the family or a manager call you and say, he has no food at home. Can you go there? Then when you have players that are older who are used to having a chef at home, their wife takes care of managing everything. They have three or four kids. They're used to a different type of service. So you see the spectrum in that way. Um, famous people that we've cooked for quite a bit of athletes because there's many teams here, but also many families choose to live here, even if their husband plays somewhere else. I've noticed that a lot. And I, we actually did a contract for the Dodgers spring training here and worked in their kitchen for spring training and worked for the um, major and minor leagues because they wanted to do more organic, healthy food. And they were sick of having processed food when they came off the field. So that was a big, big job. Um, and you met a crazy amount of people there. And I've also worked for a billionaire for three years myself in the way beginning. And his third wife, he didn't care about anything. <laughs> he was like, you can make me a hot dog. You can make me, you know, whatever. I just like you standing here. And then his third wife was like off the charts. She was like, 
I want you to go to three farms and I want you to call Maine and I want lobsters flown in. And I want, so she was like very um, high energy (laughs) with what she wanted. So it's a balance. Do you find it's normally the wife or the female of the house that has to give the stamp of approval for you? Because maybe the the male doesn't care or he's not in the house or is that not true? I will say for the first five years, I thought females were booking us more, but really the men are the instigator of the service. They, they know their family needs help or they want help and they'll set it up and pay for it. But then the wife is more nitpicky with the menu and the ingredients and you're not here on time and blah, blah, blah. So does that answer your question? It's coming. Yeah. Well, is the male because his wife can't cook (laughs) or is it because he just thinks his wife's really busy and doing a lot of things and they need help in the house and take that off her plate? The families that we work for is number two. They think she's overwhelmed and has all the kids and this and that. And we need help. Sometimes it'll be a status thing. Like they want um, somebody in to be in the home and have that you know, extra support with food. Now, what is the pros or cons of having like a, being a private chef where you live with them? I mean, I guess mm-hmm. the, the pro would be you don't have to rent, but it's probably have some cons too. You're there all the time. Yeah. I've actually hired chefs to work for me who used to be live-in chefs and had long-term contracts with families. And I will say a major con is when that relationship sours or severs, it's heartbreaking for the chef and they get you're so attached to the family you're a part of their family um you could have raised their children literally while you're there cooking um you're living on site you're so attached to their lifestyle and the way they think and what they want of you that when it ends you're kind of lost and i've had a lot of those chefs don't tend to work out with what we do going into many different homes because they can't acclimate fast enough. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure. Because they're used to like, well, I didn't know how it would be. And this is how it used to be. And da, da, da. And I'm like, I don't care. Just go in and cook and put a smile on your face. And you'll learn how that family is. And they have a hard time adjusting. They can't make that, they can't make that pivot. Huh? Yeah. And there's probably a line there. And I wonder how often that gets crossed with the live-ins because you're still the help, right? Yeah. You're the employee, employee, but you're there and you're having dinner and you're playing with the children and you're doing almost like a, a part of the family, but you're really not. Right. And there it gets confusing and, and very upsetting and like a lot of boundary lines. Like I've had people tell me stories where they're, the, they call them the principal. Their principal would call them at two o'clock in the morning and ask them to go get food at the store and walk the dog and just stuff like out of the bounds. And then when they come back to them and say, okay, can I borrow the car to go home? Or I need off these days. They would be like, no. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah. It's see how it could be really tough, you know, hard. Right. Talk about the pandemic, COVID, big in the news. How has that affected your business? And there's an added to it uh, because everyone's at home or decreased it because people don't want it. I mean, they're they're scared. I mean, what has that effect had? I think at the beginning, I was actually on the road to closing it and selling half of it as this happened. So that worked out fortunate to me. Um, The chefs that coached with me and just who I know from the industry were like blown apart because you went from making, you know, thousand dollars a week easily to zero. And they were kind of in a tailspin. Like no one will, no one wants me in their home. I'm not cooking in my home. What am I going to do? I don't, I have no business overnight. And some of them pivoted into doing other things like the membership site, teaching online cooking classes, um, speaking, other things. But um, slowly, people started letting people back in their homes or cooking in their home and delivering, which I don't love, but they still needed the food. So the need hasn't stopped. And a lot of people started coming around a little earlier who they had a relationship with. And 
people were trying to book parties like during this. So it was all across the board. Yeah. Most people were like, my life is over. And I was like, no, it's not. so it was good for coaching because people would reach out <laughs> and be like, what am I going to do, Stephanie? And I'm like, well, let's think of something else because <laughs> this is what it is. So speaking of coaching, why would someone need business coaching? You just mentioned one because they don't know what to do when the pandemic hits. But right. what else What else would they use? come see you now for? What will be a good – sell it to me. Say if I wanted to – I needed your coaching. Why would <laughs> I need you? you. <laughs> the best part of coach – what people come to me for is accountability. They want someone who's done it before who could show them – the way to set it up correctly so they make less mistakes. And the biggest part is the belief that they could do it. A lot of people think that they can't do it and they don't have X, Y, Z, like they're a special unicorn. And what a coach does is shows them that they can do it through different tools and things that I teach them. And I call coaching like, it's the fastest way to get anything you want because why would you struggle for three years and have barely any clients and want to give up every day when you could purchase a coaching package, have somebody work with you hand in hand for six months, set it up correctly so you have consistent income. Like, I don't know why anyone would do it alone, <laughs> literally. <laughs> They don't want to put that initial money up. They don't want to, you know, pay. I guess. You think of how much money. You're, first of all, you're going to quit before you could even get that far, and that's what always happens. And um, why not do something you love if you could just invest in yourself? For, a lot of people don't know how to invest in their business. That's the other thing, and they think I could buy a three hundred dollar knife, and I could buy a six hundred dollar iPhone, and all these things add up, but they don't build your business capability. So that's something I teach them also. That's that's interesting. It's good. It's same. I I have podcasts. We're on one now, and I have a, another one mm -hmm. called the Chef Educator Podcast. So I have two and a YouTube channel. And I've had people reach out to me because they don't want to take the long journey that I had to to learn all this. So now, and I've kind of started a, a kind of side business, select clients that want to start podcasting, and I will do a launch for them, just like you mentioned. I will right. take them through that, so they'll get there quicker. I'll you know and six to eight weeks, I can get them three episodes uploaded with all the backstory and everything they need in the show notes. Whereas if they tried to learn it on their own or yeah. took a class where then they by themselves, they don't have someone doing it with them. Right. You know, it's, it's people are going to do that and that's fine. It's yeah. just like you said, go to coaching, invest in yourself or your business or your dream or your goal and get it done a lot quicker and get, get on to the good stuff. Right. Why take the long road? <laughs> Life's too short. I would, I would hire, if I wanted to do a podcast, I would definitely hire somebody because me learning that it's, it's just not a good use of my time. If somebody could help me do it and do it with me and show me the right way. I'm, I'm big right. into that. And that's why I have, I like kind of, like you mentioned a couple of different packages and you customize them, but one will be the launch mm -hmm. for someone just to get up and running and then go ahead. You're all set. Yep. Or I also have management. Because other people, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do the editing and the right. and all those things. They just want to be, I want to be on the mic and I want to talk and yeah. push, promote my business. But then I have a business around. I don't want to do that other stuff. So yeah. then they could hire someone to do the management of that and make sure the shows go out. So it's interesting. And that's all pivoting. You know, that's all, I think with this COVID, it's, a, it's an entrepreneurial time. And a lot mm -hmm. of us, me being culinary and yourself and, and some of the people that work for you, you, you have to adapt. You have to change. You have to grow. Right. Or... You know, you'll be on the line somewhere and even restaurants, they, they don't have the line. Yes. And restaurants are not even hiring that to capacity as they were. Like that whole industry is hopefully going to be reborn in such a, a a way that's humanized more, I would hope. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. another podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So now you do coaching. What's some of the worst business ideas that you've ever heard of? Who's come to you with some crazy ones that you had to talk them down and say, no, let's, let's, re let's look at that again? Yeah. Now I'm a much, much better coach. So I don't like shoot people's ideas down. Like that's not going to work. I let them come to that conclusion on their own. So we look at, like I ask them a million questions about it and they will realize that like, oh my God, this is not going to work. So I like selling a higher price thing 
versus a lower ticket item, and then you have to sell more of them, especially if you're not good at sales or you're new. So when people come and they're like, I have a cookie business and I sell cookies at a market and it's they're $4 each and I sell a dozen and da, 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 and I want to make $100,000 this year. And I'm like, okay, but how many markets can you go to? Or how many can you produce a day? And then we get into the nitty gritty and it's, it's just harder to execute as one person alone. So I would teach them to sell a higher ticket item like a personal chef service for a week or a dinner party or how to do private chefing through an agency where you're making that chunk of like three to $500 a day or a service and then go back and do this. So that's one thing I, I kind of offer people. The other thing is they don't know what their time is going to be to do the actual thing. And then when we break it down, like I've had this girl, she was making um, cupcakes and we walked through everything and she was making $2 and 50 cents an hour. And she started crying because she had no idea that that's what she was really doing. Because she thought, okay, I have an order for $20. I have an order for $50 and da-da-da. And I'm like, that's amazing. But you just spent 80 hours. And here's what it is. And she was like, I can't continue doing this. So, yeah, I don't know. That's that's one of the things I have to teach my students when I'm teaching my cost control classes. I'm like, you'll be the best chef in the world and still go broke. Yeah. Because it's not about that. You need to have the business behind it and the pricing. And it has to be a viable option. Are you just wasting your time? Totally. Yeah. Great. So what if someone was interested in getting you as a coach? What would they do? How would they get a hold of you? Do you have uh, a site they can go to? Or what advice would you tell them? Or what, what could you offer them? Yeah. So first, I like people to hang out in my world a little bit and hear me teaching or speaking and see what's kind of going on, like follow a little bit. So you can find me on Facebook. I have a group called The Profit Lounge, which is business owners, a lot of chefs, talking about different things and stuff they're dealing with. And then my Facebook page is Business in Balance. And there I have a lot of videos teaching on business and especially personal chef, the earlier videos. And then the third way would be my website, which is stephanieheller.com. And you can go to the contacts page and schedule a free mini session to see what coaching is like, to see how I could help you. Um, If you have a business idea or you want to start your personal chef service or just want to talk about what you want to create, there you would do it. Wow, that is awesome. Free session right there. (laughs) So they could go to. So I'll put all these links in the show notes page. So if someone is listening, driving right now, jogging, whatever, listening to the podcast and then wants to go back to it, you don't have to try to remember it. You can go look those up. But wow, that's awesome. Awesome, going and getting a free coaching in there just to bounce the ideas off. And you don't have to be in Scottsdale, right? Because you can coach virtually anywhere. Yeah, I have clients in London and in Israel and in Portugal, so everywhere. (laughs) Everywhere. (laughs) Right. Now, when it goes to coaching, how do you do the fees? First, you have this initial discovery-like talk, and then depending on what it is, is is it usually like an hourly thing or do they buy a block of time or do they buy it by the job or does it always yeah i i love a a simple offer like just like in my personal chef service we sold two things all day long and made a lot of money so in coaching i kind of do the same i usually do a six month coaching package and i like to sell a result so we have to figure out what you actually want and then work backwards. And then we lay it out in the six months. So we do get weekly coaching, but I don't sell it hourly. It's sold as a package of time and a result together. And then there'll be weekly or hourly things in there, like meetings and consultations and things, but it's, you buy the block because if you do it any less, it won't, you won't get the outcome because it takes time. Exactly. It's like going to a personal trainer and you're like, I want to lose 50 pounds, but I want to buy one session. Okay. And then are you going to schedule it? Like it's, you're not going to get what you want. So the commitment is important because you're committing to your business and yourself through the coaching. 
You know what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. and a lot of people try to skip that. And that's how I know when you're serious. Cause they're like, all right. And I think the knowledge that you're getting and your experience that you're sharing with them is part of it and an important part. But the other part is you have you there every day, motivating them, cheerleading them, moving them along, which is what a lot of people really need to make that leap, it seems. Yeah, definitely. So they have this free coaching they can reach out. What about the people that are just on the fence? They're on that, they're not, they haven't pulled the trigger. They're like, yeah, I mean, what else do they need? Here it is free. What do you tell them? What do you, what do you, what do you say to them? Yeah. I mean, first of all, it's normal. You're not, you know, alone or weird or something's wrong with you because you're scared to try this, especially if you don't come from an entrepreneur family or nobody's ever owned their own business, but you have this desire for a reason. Don't keep shutting it down and saying, this is not for me or not right now, because that's where dreams go to die. You might as well open up and try something new and that's just what I tell anybody. Just say yes instead of no. Because we're so used to saying no to everything that your dreams lie on the other side of yes. And you will be uncomfortable and it will be annoying and it will suck. But the payoff is so much better. Hey, you have these dreams and they are just dreams until you take yeah. that first step. And then you turn them into goals yeah. and how they start making a plan. Exactly. Good advice. So anyone listening, have an idea reach out, contact Stephanie free. (laughs) Okay. Well, as we come to our end of our chat today, before we wrap up, is there any last minute advice or guidance you want to leave with the listeners? Something you want to share, whether it's someone that thinking about going to culinary school, someone that's thinking about starting their own chef business, personal or private, or someone that wants coaching or anything else that you want to leave with the listener? Yeah. So if you're thinking about going to culinary school, and you know you don't want to work in a restaurant or travel the you know path that is well worn out for you don't let that stop you from still going and having that experience because that will open you up to other things like saying yes to culinary school and showing up will lead you to the next thing you don't have to know what it is you just have to know that you want something more and same thing with personal chef service you Say yes to the thing in front of you. You don't have to have the whole how or the why figured out. It's just, what do I do next? What am I going to do today? Great advice. Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode. I want to first thank you, Stephanie, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story and all the advice and and the the time and the insight with us and, and in your honesty. You're welcome. This is fun. Memory lane. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Okay, thanks again, and I enjoyed our chat. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinary school stories at gmail.com or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207 835 1275. That's area code 207 835 1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next Culinary School Story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.